Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. This week was the Orphan Black finale. It was amazing, but as of me making this video, they have not confirmed it for season three. The episode was constructed to achieve maximum WTF from the fandom if it does not get season three. I feel like a lot of clever shows do that nowadays where they engineer themselves so that networks feel obligated to renew them, even if ratings aren't quite as good as they want them to be. Just to clarify, I do think it'll be renewed for season three, and they're probably going to make an official announcement pretty soon. If you don't notice, BBC America laid a ton of graphics bugs on top of the broadcast with notes about Tatiana Maslany being nominated for a ton of awards. Networks just don't do that for shows that they don't believe in, so it just goes to show you that BBC America really is pulling for Orphan Black season three. But let's start digging into the finale, so careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode yet, but I'm going to start with my top five moments, then I'll do an overall review of season two, and then I'll talk about season three. So here we go. Number five, Sarah turns herself into Dyad. This is a very, very cold open. I don't remember meeting Dr. Neelum before, but he's basically like the new Leaky, the new sinister looking person with mysterious intentions. Almost everyone at Dyad is sinister and mysterious though, so that's not saying a lot. Delphine is like the only one that wears her emotions on her sleeve. She's pretty easy to read, and I don't count Cosima as Dyad because she's kind of a double agent for Clone Club. I think Sarah made the right choice turning herself in before Cal and Mrs. S jumped in and had a chance to contact their insiders. There wasn't really a better way to get to Kira in a hurry. I was a little blown away when they full on tried to take one of her ovaries. Because of all the side projects that Leaky teased earlier this season, like the artificial womb, I actually thought the show was going to show us some sort of gruesome Frankenstein baby maker. We did end up getting a Frankenstein moment later in the episode, but I felt like Sarah's escape was one of the most cheerable moments in the episode, like her escaping from Rachel. I like the way they use Kira scenes to kind of highlight the science and the more technical aspects of the story too. Like using Kira to explain the fire extinguisher mechanism, as well as what's going to become the story of season three with the Dr. Moreau stuff. Kira wins science so hard in this episode. Number four, Cal and Mrs. S reveal their inside men. I was totally surprised by the Paul and Marion reveals. I read some interviews with Michelle Forbes a couple of weeks ago after her character debuted, and she just said that Marion would be getting crazier and crazier all the way into the finale. I wouldn't call her crazy, but Marion is like the neolutionist analog of Mrs. S. They're both very caring, nurturing mothers, but they sit on two sides of the fence. Season three is going to explain those allegiances a little bit better, but I feel like as of the end of the episode, we're meant to apply that Mrs. S is in bed with the military, Paul, and Project Caster, all the male clones. And just to explain, when Mrs. S told Cal he didn't know his mythology, Caster is one of the twin sons of Leda. She was a Greek princess. She was seduced by Zeus, who appeared to her as a swan and impregnated her. That same night, she also slept with her husband, King Tenatus, and she ended up giving birth to four children, two girls and two boys. So the girls were Helen of Troy and Clemenstra, and the boys were Castor and Pollux. Because Leda slept with Zeus and her mortal husband, Castor was born of the husband's mortal line, and Pollux was born of Zeus's. You may be more familiar with Castor and Pollux by their Latin name. Together they're known as Gemini, as in Gemini twins. It's just a high-minded metaphor for the way the military compartmentalized Project Leda, you know, into Project Castor and Project Dyad. Paul is obviously working with the military, and because Marion said that she's trying to learn which other big group was trying to influence the cloning projects, and then it cut to the military in the episode, I think we can assume that they're that other big group. They're probably going to take the antagonist role that the Prolethians had in season two. They're just going to be like the other side of the coin. If it wasn't clear, Paul was Mrs. S's inside man, and Marion was Cal's. She was that person trying to hack him on the dark web. Marion seemed like she wanted to help Clone Club, but just like we learned a lot more about Mrs. S that wasn't super flattering in Season 2, I think the same is going to happen in Season 3 with the Marion character. But I'm so happy Michelle Forbes is going to stay on board. Number 3, Sarah shoots Rachel in the eye. As horrible as it was, I was kind of happy to see her taken in the face. If you apply TV logic though, she is not dead. She'll be back next season with an eye patch. That pencil didn't look like it penetrated deep enough into her skull to cause brain damage, but she's definitely not going to keep that eye. In case you don't watch Doctor Who, there was this character called Madame Kovarian that Rachel is starting to resemble more and more. She was just a really evil person with an eye patch. I actually felt a little bit of sympathy for her whenever Duncan committed suicide. He was like her father, but at this point in the narrative, she's eroded all of our goodwill. The other really funny thing about this whole scene was that Kira had drawn a picture of the fire extinguisher, and she would have had to have drawn that before she played science with Cosima. They're starting to blur the line between intuition and full-on foresight. It's like Kira is reading Matrix code while all the other characters are stuck inside the construct. And now that Gracie is pregnant with Helena's baby, there will be another potential Kira. All the clones are different though, so it's hard to tell what special abilities that baby might manifest. The real takeaway though is that Rachel's going to be back next season and twice as mean. Number two, the island of Dr. Moreau. 
I love the way they connected Cosima's Buckminster-Fuller golden ratio speech to Duncan's research and the end reveal of all the male clones. Just like an endlessly repeating pattern in nature. And they're all stuck on this island of monsters. I think in reality the island is going to turn out to be wherever the military is performing all their experiments. But I'm not expecting them to show an actual island. I don't think they're going to take the metaphor that literally. Even though Dr. Neelam was introduced at the beginning of the episode, I don't think he's the Dr. Moreau in this situation. I think that that person is someone we won't meet until Season 3. And then there's all the people in the Topside organization that Marion teased. Most of Season 2 has been spent learning about the Perlethian agenda versus the Dyad agenda, and now we have to learn about the military's agenda. But I think based on the way they were teased, they're just trying to create an infinitely renewable source of bodies for their army. Right now I'm picturing someone like the Stephen Lang character from Avatar being in charge, like the military big bad. He played Colonel Quaritch, you know, someone who doesn't see themselves as evil, but literally will step on people with giant mech feet whenever they get in the way. I also think that it was implied that the military has a lot more control over Project Caster than the Dyad had over their cloning experiment, so it seems like Clone Club is really going to have to raise the bar if they're going to infiltrate them. Paul will always have a soft spot for Sarah, so they'll at least have him on the inside. Helena, it seems though, is someone Paul is all too happy to sacrifice. They're probably going to use her the same way that Prolethians try to do, to just grow more Kiras, basically. And my number one moment, obviously, Mark is the male clone, and there are a lot of him. This was the major reveal of the episode. Of all the surprises we got, this was probably my most unexpected. I actually thought we'd see another version of Tony whenever he turned around in Miriam's basement. I think as we meet more Mark clones next season, they'll display the same level of diversity of personalities that Sarah's clones do. Although I guess technically Rachel was the first clone, you know, like the beta test. That just means that Mark and Gracie's story is going to get folded back into clone clubs at a certain point. And if you think about the relationship between Sarah, Kira, and Cal, I think that Mark and Gracie's story is going to be a little bit like that. Sarah doesn't care anything about the Dyad or the Prolethean stuff. She just wants to keep Kira safe and live out their lives in peace. So I think that Mark and Gracie are just going to be on the run in Season 3, you know, just like Sarah and Kira. Even if Mark isn't just a carbon copy male version of Sarah, I think he's going to turn out to be a good person. The creators actually talked a lot about Mark's character. He said that he was modeled after World War II soldiers, which kind of makes me wonder if the military's been experimenting with clones since the 50s. All the Project Leta stuff was from the 70s, but if that came from the military, they had to start somewhere. We'll probably learn that whole story over the course of Season 3, you know, when the military started and what their master plan is. Seeing Charlotte at the end, too, kind of made me excited at the thought that we'll see more Tonys next season, you know, more versions of Sarah. So overall, I thought the finale was a rock-solid A. You know, the story was amazing, but I also had to give it a lot of bonus points for technical achievements. For example, Tatiana Maslany had to perform that dance party scene a bunch of times for each clone, and they had to digitally add them together to give us Clone Club. Just getting those few minutes of footage probably took weeks to complete in editing. I know I mentioned it during my top five moments, but Tatiana Maslany gets nominated for a crazy number of acting awards every year. I hope she ends up winning at least one Emmy for season two. Being able to create all those unique personalities and jump back and forth between them while they shoot is just amazing. Most actors find it difficult to play one character. So that's actually where we need to talk about Mark's character because he's obviously going to have to play a lot of different versions of that clone. The actor's name is Ari Millen. He's the one playing Mark. The creator said that he didn't know he was playing a clone whenever they cast him. And they actually intended to kill him in episode 6, but they liked him so much that they expanded his part. Shows do that all the time. It's like on Game of Thrones, the producers gave the Shea character a much bigger part. They just liked her performance so much, so they changed the story to accommodate that. I think it's a good omen for all the male clones we'll see in Season 3, but I'm not expecting the same level of performance that Tatiana Maslany gives, but I'm looking forward to Ari, the actor, proving me wrong. I have to say the most fun I have watching the show is whenever all the clones are together on screen. So if he can do a male clone version of Clone Club that's as fun as the female Clone Club, Season 3 is going to be amazing. A lot of time I don't even care about the science aspects of the show, but I do love the way they weave existentialism and comedy into it. It makes it a lot easier to digest all the genetics talk. The science of the show is amazing, but I really just watch it for Tatiana Maslany and all the other characters. I don't have a whole lot more to say about Season 3 other than we're shifting focus from the Prolethians to the military. It's all about the Gemini twins, two sides of the story, so the military is just going to be the other side of that next year. And like I said, they're probably not going to wait very long before making a Season 3 announcement. And on the off chance that they do not renew it, I send out all of my digital hugs to you guys. After you have time to process the episode, I highly recommend you start catching up on Doctor Who because Series 8 is premiering in August and I'm going to be doing a ton of videos for it and it's going to be awesome. Be sure to subscribe to get all that stuff. I'm not going to be doing an Orphan Black Q&A tomorrow or anything, so if you have any questions about the season or this episode, just post them in the comments below. But right now, click here to watch all my other Season 2 videos, 
and click here to learn all about Doctor Who Series 8. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you tonight. High fives.